okay, so listen. You know, uh, you know in you know in trailers, you know in trailers when they say from the visionary director of, or from the twisted mind of, and usually it's always slightly overblown or annoying. But here's one man I think it fully applies to. He's been blowing us all away for 45 years since the first Mad Max in 1979. And now here with the fifth film of the saga, please be upstanding for Dr. George Miller. How the hell do you make a film like that? But we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, before we start that, maybe uh, you can tell us that we actually have like a connection with this film that relates to the leading lady. So maybe you can tell that story. Well, um, when we when we decided to make this film, I had no idea uh, who could play Furiosa, uh, given that the, the, whoever was to play it had big shoes to fill, and. Um, I happened, we were, I was in London, we had, and you showed me the first cut, an early cut of Last Night in Soho, and I sat and watched the, the, the movie, it was just at the beginning of COVID, 2000. It was just before the lockdown, it was like two nights before they locked down the UK. Yeah, and we, um, and, and I, I was watching the, the film, and I was really caught up in the film, and then, Anya appeared, and there was something very compelling about her. And I don't remember exactly what I, 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 I said. We went out to, 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 to dinner. And in I was, an empty in restaurant. The, what was in it? an empty pre-pandemic yeah, restaurant. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> and we <laughs> both had, we both had <laughs> sniffles. <laughs> yes, and then we both thought we had it. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 I, and I said something like, my memory of it was this, I said, you know, Anya, she'd be great for, and you didn't know, and you didn't know what I was talking about or what film. And before I finished the sentence, you said, "Do it, do it. She can, she can do anything, anything. She's got it all." That's my memory of it. And you were so, you were so confident about it because, because we we known each other. I thought, okay, that's about that's it. I, I trust you, trusted you. I've heard that from other directors in the past, and really fine directors, that you never quite can get the, the, the truth sometimes. But you were so confident. You didn't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> and, and, and I was really, uh, and, and so uh, she actually did, did some sort of, some sort of uh, tape for, for us. We talked about it. She read the screenplay, and then we went through this preparation. And about two weeks into the shoot, I was, you know, I, I, the, the, the day was, I, I was, I, I went up to her and I said, uh, for me, you're Furiosa, you're no longer Anya. And, 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 uh, and you were absolutely right. It's subsequently, I learned why you were so confident. She could do anything, everything. She's, she's, you know, I could go on for it. Uh, and, and I was, uh, and the, the, the and each, as the film went on, and the material was coming in, she was doing such a, a, a great work. Uh, you know, I'd say, thanks, Edgar. Thanks, Edgar. <laughs> mind, yeah. I remember the day afterwards, I texted her and said, you may get a text from George Miller. Did you <laughs> I did. Yes. And she was like, what? Yeah, so, yeah. Just, um, uh, I, this is the second time I've seen it tonight, and something when I saw it the first time, I was just in a screening with you, I was really struck by how the ending uh, sort of comes full circle with the first Mad Max in a way, in terms of the word, like a very creative revenge. And I was just wondering, before we get into Furiosa, obviously like Mad Max came out 45 years ago in 1979. Apart from the obvious, what are the most vivid differences between making this film and, and making your first film? Oh, huge actually. Uh, Mad Max was... Uh, a bewilderment to me. I, 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 it did, I didn't know at the time that uh, things, that in making any film is, is, um, is like, 
I, 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 th I thought if you prepare the hell out of a movie, that it all, all the rest was it just a, a smooth execution, and I wasn't prepared for all things going wrong, and and I actually, I actually even even though the film uh, was successful, I actually didn't think I was uh, cut out uh, for filmmaking, and uh, and and and. Uh, so, so I've certainly made more difficult films, like the second one, which was in res as a result of doing the things that I learned. I'm talking about uh, Road Warrior or Mad Max 2. Uh, that was made uh, as a result of all the things that I discovered from making the first film. And that was much more arduous, but uh, it wasn't nearly as panicked. And I'd say by the time, all this time later, that we, we did this film, uh, I'd learnt, um, first of all, I worked with really fine cast and crew, um, but I've learnt that, um, uh, look, after that first Mad Max, I don't want to give long answers, but, but uh, after that first Mad Max, um, I remember talking to Peter Weir, who'd done two features, and I said, um, Gee, I'm not cut out to do this. He said, why? And I explained why. Nothing went the way it should. It was like walking a big dog and I wanted to go this way and it dragged me off this way. <laughs> and and, and uh, he said, but George, it's always like that. He used this analogy about uh, Vietnam. It's just the end of the Vietnam War. He says, it's like being a, on patrol with your platoon and you don't know where the... Uh, landmines are, you don't know where the snipers are, but you've got to finish the mission and you've got to be agile enough to adjust to any circumstance and still get the result. And I, I've carried that ever since. And as we know, it's always, it's, it, can, it can get quite crazy. And it's really interesting then how to triage problems so you can actually find your way through and often come up with really good solutions to, to that. Secondly, all these years to even understand that and so whatever happened on this film whether COVID and 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 j just the rigor of doing heavy stunts or whatever whatever happened you know it it, it was it felt much more uh, uh you know it, it, it felt more uh, much more uh, um i'm trying to find the, the notion of it much more comfortable even even the, those moments when it got unpredictable, unpredictable. That's that's the big difference across all those years. Well, one before we talk about Furiosa, I mean, one thing about doing the Road Warrior in Mad Max Two, given that you had a tough experience on the first one, the leap of ambition between the first and the second one in terms of the style and the world is is huge. So just I mean, just talk about the the. the I mean, I think what's amazing about that film is it's so much more idiosyncratic and the style of it kind of remains into this film. So what gave you the kind of, um, what gave you the sort of the courage to sort of go that much bigger with the second one? Well, it, look, the first one was very low budget. The initial story was to be set in contemporary Melbourne about a cop who family would, uh, same story. and. And, and we, uh, we were to do that. And then we realised we couldn't afford to block off streets, we couldn't <laughs> afford extras, we couldn't afford buildings uh, to go into buildings or whatever. It was very low budget. So it just, just, just to solve it, we put a few years from now and went into a dystopian world. So we could shoot, we, we could shoot in, in, uh, in, in empty back streets on the edges of town, we could go into buildings that were basically dilapidated. They gave it to us for nothing. And that inadvertently took the film into from uh, it, it's a, a contemporary uh, and probably unlikely story within contemporary Melbourne at the time into, into allegory. And, and it was, and then despite all the, all the trouble of making it and the, and the, the kind of anguish you know, my best friend and Byron Kennedy, my partner's best friend from school, put money into it. And there's no other financing. And, 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 and friends of theirs and so, and, and so on. 
and I was desperate not to lose their, 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 their money. Anyway, he succeeded internationally in 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 in, um, in Japan. They said, "Oh, he's a samurai," uh, and in, in in Scandinavia, they said, "He's a lone Viking," and the, and the French said, "It's their westerns on wheels." And then suddenly, I thought, "Okay, we tapped into some archetype." That led me to Joseph Campbell and understanding, and it's been. I'm still doing it, not only trying to figure out how to tell stories, but why we tell stories. And, 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 and just like the American Western from the, from the silent movies were allegorical, so the, the, these, this, the, you know, these films are. We took that into Mad Max 2, much more conscious of it, and, uh, and, and, and even though that was a, a kind of a wilder production, I knew by then that we were on patrol in Vietnam and we were, you know, had to get through it and whatever happened, we had to adjust to everything. And so it was bit by bit. Um, you know, I, 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 was, I was asked to, to talk about, um, to, to, to write something about Steven Spielberg. I was lucky, lucky enough to, to work with him, way, to, to watch him on set, way back when we did Twilight Zone movie. And I had this sense about him. You, you, you know the folk tale of Br'er Rabbit and the Briar, Briar Patch? He, it felt like he was Br'er Rabbit in the Briar Patch. He was completely at ease on a movie set. And I thought, God, this is his natural habitat. <laughs> and, and it's taken me all this time to get close to that. And it's really interesting to, 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 to understand why. Well, between Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome and Fury Road, Obviously, you made other films in the interim, live action and animation, but what brought you back after 30 years? What could you not let go of that you had to return to this world? The, big, the biggest thing, uh, look, it's always driven by story. And an idea came to me is, uh, is uh, you know, that there's always a shift in. in, in, in in, in anything we do, and particularly in, in cinema. And I realised that the audiences are reading, we speed reading the language of cinema now, in a way. And I thought, what would we like to tell a story in which all the exposition had to be told on the run? In other words, it's a continuous chase or a race. And then the idea was, what if the, what if the MacGuffin, so-called, was human? So it was the story of five wise men and beings. But that, that sort of came to me as an idea, but the biggest thing by far, once that story was starting to form, was the difference in the technology. Um, I, you know, I was lucky enough to be there at the beginning of the digital dispensation, early 90s, with the movie Babe. Uh, we were universal, simply because they had just done Jurassic Park, they understood what, what, what uh, you, you know, what, what the technology could do. We could make the animals talk, um, and that drove Babe, uh, the Babe films, and then Andrew Leslie, the cinematographer on Babe, went to shoot Lord of the Rings, early, early 2000s. Um, he showed me the first motion capture of Gollum. I had no idea what good motion capture was, but I realised that's how we could get the, the penguins to dance in the story we had on the, on the, on the Happy Feet. And, f and, and having done the animations, I suddenly realised this technology, you can, the cameras are much more agile. Everything is much, much freer on, on, on every level of filmmaking. So to do that with an action film, doing things that we couldn't do three decades before or whatever it was, was very, very enticing. Again, always driven by story, but the tools as they changed, it was very exciting to me. And that informed so much of what we did on Fury Road. Um, even the simplest things like erasing your tracks in the sand. And I remember reading about Lawrence of Arabia. <coughs> they had camel tracks. And imagine you do a take, then you, well, what do you do with the sand? They bring helicopters in from the Jordanian army. That took a long time, and some guy figured out, some some group or something figured out, to a, a kind of on a big bit of like a, a fishing rod, putting one of those powder puffs. You know, our mothers used to 
make up a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah make, well, well, the, the powder yeah, yeah. thing, and, the, and, and do that with the sand. Now, now, by the time you get to the desert in Namibia, and you do, you know, a number of takes, you could just go over your tracks, keep the traction you want and need, and erase the others. Um, so many things on so many levels, including safety, uh, that was the big enticement for me uh, doing. And then just to finish that, the, the, the difference between the technology we used on Fury Road, not almost a decade ago, it, and what we did on Furiosa is, is again quite significant. I mean, we, we're in an ever-evolving process. It's always been the same. It's I want to talk about that in a second, but one thing I wanted to ask is, am I right in thinking that you wrote Furiosa before Fury Road? Is that correct? Or at the same no, time? No, no, we wrote Fury Road first. But in order to make, to in order to inform Fury Road, we started to write the backstories of Furiosa and Max. Because there's no way you could have even designed the film, just the physical design, costumes and cars and weapons, but even, or, uh, or, or even the behaviour, the, all the gestures, all of the language and, and so on of the film, unless there was an underlying logic. And, and otherwise it would be too random. So we had to write some sort of document about the world and, and Furiosa's story and Max's story and that, and, 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 and they eventually, that because the film kept getting delayed, that uh, Furiosa ended up as a screenplay. So by the time the, we started actually for real on, on, on uh, Fury Road, uh, we were able to give that to the cast and crew. Uh, and uh, I remember indeed uh, Charlize said, when she read it, uh, for probably about six months before, read Furiosa, she said, can we shoot this one first? <laughs> and, 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 and I said, shall we be planning this other film? No, we, we, we couldn't, of course. But, 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 um, but, but and, and, and so, uh, when Fury Road got, got traction, uh, it, 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 it felt, it felt, it, 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 it felt we, that we should do it. I, I, I was, you know, very engaged in the story. And, what was interesting to me is that it was a different, it, it wasn't a repetition of Fury Road. The, the two films, as you saw, one butts directly in, into the next one. And, and that was, you know, that, that was interesting to me too. The, you know, one happens over three days and two nights, this is 18 years really. And that was a, a, a different rhythm. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Fury Road wasn't so much written as drawn. Or I rather like you worked a long time with Brendan McCarthy drawing the entire movie. Did you adopt a similar process with this? No, no. Um, well, Fury Road was drawn, and and, uh, and and then we then we had to write a screenplay for it to go to to the studio and cast and crew because they storyboards you, you because they don't have the rhythm of time in you know really implied into you can't really judge it. So we wrote a screenplay, but it was it had illustrations and, and concept art in it, a bit a bit like you know, the reading. You know, I remember, I remember reading Baby Driver, and you sent me you, you sent me the, the the script, which is I read on my iPad, and you had those little icons where you click on the on those little earphones, and as you were reading it. You were listening to the music that you eventually had in the movie. The, the, that's that's the sort of thing we just did visually. Anyway, to answer your question, that was all storyboarded because that was by far, that was by far the most accurate way we could get convey the information of the shot. You could describe it, but you, it's much easier to illustrate it. Also, on that film, we did a number of sequences with previous. Fairly clumsy. Previous can be quite quite slow. This film was almost flipped. We certainly had storyboards, but with extended sequences, we used a system that uh, Guy Norris, uh, who's who, who's the second unit director, stuck on and we you know, working to, been working together so long. And a twenty-one year old stuntman on the Road Warrior, yeah. Twenty-one year old stuntman on the Road Warrior played about three roles. 
Now he and his two sons developed this system called Proxy, which is basically using the Unreal Engine to to uh, and the physics and, and so on and, and, and uh, uh, to to actually do uh, basically map out the sequence in, in in real time. You could you could uh, you could design the vehicle that that, that Chrome War Rig. Uh, incredibly precisely, you could you could take every every bike and every vehicle and every human. Uh, you could put in your cameras. We use the Agile with the crane a, a, a lot. There were also a thing called TikTok, which which was a sort of a, a crane system to get those guys who were flying and their parachutes and parasails and things like that. We could do all of that virtually, and then use frames from that as storyboards. So we had, so on, on the call sheet, you get the, sto the storyboards. And, and then you, and, but then you had everything, the movement, a, a full simulation, not, not a simulation, but a full rendered, uh, uh, rendering of the, of, of the scene. Uh, we called it, we, we modified it toy bikes. I didn't, I didn't want to have the humans looking real, so they look like little toy soldiers, still looking like their characters, so they were coloured a certain way. Because I, I didn't want to inter One of the things I say to storyboard artists, I don't want to see performance on the on the faces. Uh, but one great storyboard artist I work with, um, Mark Sexton, can't help himself. And, and, and because he does a lot of comics, and I'll, I'll never forget, um, there was a shot he drew in Fury Road um, of Furiosa. And um, and I realised that Charlie's based a performance on the, what he had drawn. It's one shot, just her looking over her uh, over her arm. <coughs> Is it free? And and I, and, I, and I said to him, please don't do it on, on this because um, it could, because it's it's already preempting what, the work of the actor. So I made sure that the that all the, all, all the characters in this were still like little coloured plastic soldiers, um, specifically for that. But if you wanted to do something much more, uh, uh, you know, much more real, uh, you could do it. Anyway, that was the big difference on this film. And we did all the big sequences, and even blocking some of the more static scenes, simply, simply because uh, we could do it. Uh, it was a kind of pre-vis that then goes into post-vis, which basically sets up all the visual effects that you need to do. So to, again, that tool wasn't available 10 years ago. We'll talk about, just let's just take the stowaway sequence in the middle of the film just as an example. Even with that previous tool, like when, you, when you're sitting around doing that, like one of the things about the way you direct is that like the, the choice of the angles is always perfect. There's nothing really repeated. There's no real sort of coverage in the sense of some like, action directors might shoot something with seven cameras and just hose it down and then cut it together. But you're incredibly specific and meticulous. So even before you get onto the set, how long does that take for you and Guy and I'm not sure maybe your VFX, who, who would be part of that team and, and how long would it take to work out the angles for that stowaway sequence? That, uh, that, that, that happens in the process of doing the, uh, in doing the, the, the proxy or the toy box thing that we called it. Um, look, I, just on this, like, any action sequence, the first thing is it's got to be character driven. Uh, that's obvious. Um, otherwise, it's just surface. Um, so, so, it, 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 you're looking at the dramaturgy exactly as you would do a dialogue sequence or, or something else. Um, the second thing is, I, um, it's a kind of, there's no question, it's a kind of visual music. And in the same way that music, there's a strong causal relationship between one note or one chord and the next, I believe it's the same with, 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 with uh, you know, with the cin cinema, particularly kinetic sequences, as, you know, the, with the faster rhythm. So you, you, there's, that's got to be built into the design of the film. We can do it today. You can't, once you had to write it, and you can't describe that, and you can't even really 
indicated on storyboards, but now you can do that. So that's 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 the first thing. That's the first thing. Um, I uh, the the um, so putting that together with with, with with putting that together was really really key. Connecting each one moment to the next, and once you do that, and that's done. To be honest, that's explored when, while we're putting it together. Knowing what the story is, knowing what you do. I think we did some rough storyboards, knowing it's at, at concert art on the way. But you're building the sequence uh, to a point where uh, you've got enough information for everybody to know exactly what's happening. And there are a lot of people uh, involved in, in, in that stuff. You know, not the least of the safety people, all the rigging, every single person has got harnesses on, and there's, 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 there's uh, you know, of, of course, there's scaffolding and, and, and things that, the mobile scaffolding that, that you, you can erase it, you know, you, you erase it and post and things like that. So that's the way. And, and, and the other thing that happened, that happened in this film, for instance, with that, with that raw rig, is we, we thought, look, we need something else. So as we're doing the previous, we, we, we decided to use those claws, those hydraulic claws, and so because they become, so it's much more, uh, it, it, it's much more plastic, and you're evolving, and plus, I, I've, got a, I've got a strong visual imagination, but I could never, in my mind, keep all, all, those, all, all those spatial dynamics in my head, uh, unless we had a tool. For instance, you, you know, we were under the war rig, we were on top of the war rig, in front of the back, and we were in the airspace around it. And you can imagine the shots, but to see how one shot flowed into the next, I, 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 you could do it, but you couldn't hold the whole sequence in your head. And, so, and, and then as you're putting together in a way that's readable, then you can say, oh, then you see the opportunity for something. So it's almost like going out and improvising a sequence, but you're doing it virtually, and then you're making those adjustments. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, at what, at what point, because obviously you work with your, um, your uh, wife, Margaret Sixot, who's your editor, does she get involved at that point, or does she come in when you shot the footage? No, no, she gets involved way after we shot. She doesn't, both on Fury Road and, and this, she... she she sort of glanced at the screenplay, but, but when she's in the cutting room, she, she's putting aside all the aspirations, what we tended to shoot, everything, and just, judge, and just judges each, each shot and each frame, basically, on its merits, regardless of what I wanted it to be. <laughs> she, she will, which, is, which is really great, because she's seeing it fresh. But that's great. I mean, it's something that's. I mean, it's interesting that you say you can't understand the geography of it because I, I think you're the director who is the best at spatial geography, in action and in drama. It's just incredible, and uh, it, it, it. So it's interesting to me that you say that because I would say that that's the thing that I take away from it. I mean, one other thing. I mean, we're gonna unfortunately have to wrap up soon, but like I want to just ask a couple more things. Just talk to me about when I'm watching a film like that. I have no sort of concept at some point. What is there and what isn't? What is location? What is sets? Like, especially like in the bullet farm in that quarry, I was really trying to figure out what I'm actually looking at. So, what is that process and who are you? You're sitting down with your production designer and your VFX person to sort of figure out how to extend a sequence like that. Say, with that one specific location, what exactly are we looking at? You're looking, uh, first of all, uh, the location actually. A location very similar to it exists way in the centre of Australia. There's a gold mine that that looks very very similar to the, to that, and um, and I work with with a wonderful production designer, uh, Colin Gibson, who wants to do everything real. That gold mine is in very remote location, has about accommodation for about a, 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 a hundred people working on the mine, and it's got all the equipment and so on. The shooting crew on this film was 1,200. <laughs> so, so, so to do, so to do, um, to do that, and, and, and Colin said, no, we've got to go out there, we've got to, 
go out there. We'd still be there. I really believe we would. So what we did is we basically, ba basically took most of the shape of, of particularly the, the, the main, the, 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 the main uh, road where the, 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 that, uh, that was all, you know, at the mine where, where the truck and everything sort of happened, where they're warring and where everything happens. And we took that and we um, reproduced the key moments on a location much closer to Sydney where we were free to sort of really do earthworks and so on, build the big port colours, added things that weren't available in the mine. You had to, you know, where they were kind of what we call the favelas, those where people stayed. You know, you, you had a sense that there were there were places where the people who worked at Bullet Farm uh, were, you know, there was sort of accommodation uh, around the walls of it. We built, there were, the tiers were there in the original mine, but we added some of the various terraces. Uh, the buildings, uh, for instance, uh, there, was a, there was a thing we called a conveyor belt, a big, big some, sort of, some sort of conveyor belt, which is that big arm that catches the warring. That existed at the mine. There were, there were lots of excavators and, and things like that. That existed there, but we actually got you know, got them uh, in location much closer to Sydney. So, so, it, and then we did, you know, what we couldn't do in the, in the mine, we, we, we created digitally. So it's, a, it's definitely a mixture of real. Look, there's the, the, big, the, the big things with these films, which, um, in which there's, we, we don't defy the laws of physics, there's no f people flying or, or vehicles flying. And, um, and, and so you have to have what's, a, what's essentially where you predict the eye scan of, of the audience will be, which I think you can shot for shot. You, can, you know where the majority of the eyes are going to be scanning. You've got to make sure that that's, you've got to make sure that that's real. And, and, and the rest you can build around it. So, you know, when, when you see Dementus ride into a storm, that's Chris Hemsworth riding into a storm, but all that, you know, you, uh, all that dust storm and, and stuff that he rides into it has to be created digitally. You could do it, you could do it, uh, you know, with massive wind machines and so on, but you wouldn't get the result that you're, you're looking for. So it's a mixture of two. Two quick questions to wrap up. One from me, one from somebody else. Um, Fury Road and Furiosa, I think, can both uh, be described as pure cinema, but what does that phrase mean to you? Oh, that, look, I, I started, you know, I, 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 I got into film simply by my, I, I used to do, uh, uh, I used to draw and paint a, a lot, that was my, my interest, and, and I, I, I got in, and, and then I became interested in cinema, and, and I was I read Kevin Brownlow's book, The Parades Gone By, had a big effect on me. Uh, he basically said all the syntax of cinema, you know, cinema is just 130 years old, and 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 a brand new language that is now global, it's a universal language, and the language was invented by the silent filmmakers in Europe and basically America. Uh, my understanding of you know, others might know better. I, I remember reading once that when they first, when people first saw a, a close-up of a head turning, they screamed because they thought it was a disembodied head. And, and that now, that, that language is read by little kids before they read in their own language. Anyway, um, so I went into the cinema, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, and, 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 and I really, for me, they, I realised that, that Kevin Brownlow was right. When sound came along, as we all know, things slowed down a lot, and then the equipment and everything got more agile uh, during the next uh, decades. And now we're at a point now with digital cameras, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there is an argument, depending on the film, for shooting celluloid, but having shot you know, for a long time on celluloid, 
by law. It's such a it, it's such an antiquated system uh, by and large. Even for instance, just, I'm, I'm off the track, but uh, uh, but but, uh, but 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 I remember on uh, on the first Mad Max, we had an explosion, and we had to and we had I think two cameras on it, and we wanted to shoot the explosion. I think. Uh, I think we wanted to shoot at 96 frames or even 48 frames. To put the mag on, load it up, I don't know, 2,000 foot reels, we base, and then for somebody to actually uh, start the camera and then be driven out, you used half of the 2,000 feet just in that moment. And if anything happened or it was delayed, you'd have the explosion and you've run out of, you've run out of that film. Now, the chips, at least 45 minutes, you can start the camera and get everyone out. Just on that simple, uh, it, 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 you never make the sort of films that you could. I, I'm, 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 I'm in utter uh, uh, wonder of, of how great cinema was done, uh, uh, it, you know, it, it, in, in those days. The time it would take to do it. Um, uh, with, and, and to do it for real, uh, just is, um, is, is, you know, is, is quite extraordinary to me. Anyway, so, so, um, so what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered it. Yeah. Well, it's pure cinema. <laughs> oh, yeah, pure, there's no question to me. And uh, look, I, 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 uh, you know, I, 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 I I remember hearing Roman Polanski say there was only one perfect place for the camera at any given moment. And having done animation, I was able to do that in, 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 in practice. I, I saw that that was the case. And, and, um, and, and, and I'll give you a really, I'll try to make this quick, and really, if you saw Happy Feet, there, you, you, you meet the mother, and you meet the father, uh, no, you meet the mother and father, and then you meet the egg. And then little, the little penguin comes out, and the family is, is together. That's the you know, opening stanza, if you like, of, 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 of the movie. Then we, cu then we cut to, uh, originally, we cut to a school teacher who's teaching all the little penguins. And, and when we watch the film, and it was all lens, it was fully performed, uh, the voices, and pretty good rendering of what it would look like. And suddenly I realized that I made a real mistake. The audience had no idea where the film, who were the key characters. Because we go, we meet mother, father, little penguin, and a school teacher. We, 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 there's no direction there. So we, without changing anything except the camera, we re-lens the sequence, where instead of seeing the school teacher, we see the little penguin go to school. We follow the penguin into, the, into school, and, and we tell the story. At that moment, the audience knows, purely by the, by, by the point of view of the camera, that this is the story of a little penguin. We set up the story. And I tell you, had we not done that, the, 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 the film would have lost all its rhythm. It would uh, be another 10 minutes before you realise, ah, this is the guy we're following. So Polanski was right. And, I, and, and, that, and the next film I was doing was, was Fury Road. And it was real. And for a while now I thought, gee, I've really got to be thinking really, really carefully as to where the camera is going to be at any moment. And, uh, and, and so... Anyway, that's what I mean by Pearson, I guess. Well, funny enough, my last question has already just been answered, because this is from our mutual friend, Anya Taylor-Joy, and her question was, what informed Furiosa that you learned while making Happy Feet? <laughs> <laughs> so she was, like, way ahead of us. You, that was really her question. You already just, you literally just answered it. Well, I think we have to wrap up there. I, not just for tonight, not just for this film, but let's thank George Miller for 45 years of incredible...